following interview was conducted with Professor John Carlson, Professor Emeritus of Economics in the Brainerd School of Management for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, July 11, 2008 at Stewart Center, the University of Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Okay. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your family and growing up in your early years. Okay. Um, I was born on the 4th of July in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, my father had gotten his PhD in economics from Harvard. He had just taken a job at Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. So uh, when I was two months old, I moved to Ohio and grew up there. Um, went to college at Denison University, which is a good liberal arts college, um, not far from Columbus. Um, Tell us about your early years in high school, I guess, including high school as well. Well, I was... How large uh, a town was that? It was a small town, about 2,000 people. Okay. So my graduating class was 20 students. So in high school? In high school. So to be valedictorian, it's not all that much of an achievement. <laughs> <laughs> but there were a lot of children of faculty there. So in my class is now a prominent lawyer in New York, a psychiatrist in Boston, and me, and several others that uh, did quite well. So and you're keeping it, that kept in touch? I've been kept in touch with several of them, yes. Very good. Including a real entrepreneur who stayed in town and now owns a lot of downtown. <laughs> Very good. And what was, can you tell us about college life? What, uh, did you, did you board or did you pro course of study? Well, I really found going from high school to college a big jump. It, school uh, was larger. School, not a lot not larger. Not no. lot, okay. Well, oh yeah, oh yes, the school was <laughs> as large as my town, that's right. Uh, I found, you know, I had to work a lot harder and uh, my first English composition I got a D on. It shook me up, and I realized you know, I really had to buckle down in my homework assignments. Yeah. How'd you happen to select Denison? Well, I wanted, I actually I liked Antioch, but I wanted to get out of town. So I um, looked at Oberlin and Denison. I, I thought, well, I don't want to be too far away. So um, Oberlin, well, I probably had a better academic reputation. I just didn't feel as comfortable there. And again, I think I would have liked it if I'd gone. Denison recruited me. They offered me a scholarship. To, that that's, that's very that sold me. And sure. It's only about a 90-mile drive from right. where I lived. Well, tell us a little about campus life and student activities and your course major. A lot, a lot of the activities centered around the fraternity system. At the time, 95% of the men were in fraternities. So it was pretty much necessary for social life. Sure. Join a fraternity. Right. And uh, so there are a few all-campus activities, but most of the social life was through the fraternity. Uh, I was treasurer for two years. What fraternity were you in? Uh, Chi Alpha. Okay. Good. What was your course of study? What did you? I majored in mathematics, uh, mostly because I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I'd been pretty good in math. And I'd seen a lot of people that had taken math majors and done all sorts of things. So I felt left my options open. Sure. And, uh, by the time I was a senior, though, it was clear I didn't want to go on graduate school in mathematics. And I was facing the draft. What year would this have been? I would have graduated in 1955. Okay. And so I started taking other courses like accounting and economics. During your senior year? During my senior year to uh, move away from math, even though that was my major. And what I did then was take a job in New York City. After you graduated? After I graduated in actuarial training. Actually, what I did, senior year, I took a theater appreciation course. And there was a trip to New York. And you've never been to New York before? I've never been. Well, yes, I'd been there when I was a freshman. I actually hitchhiked there once when the oh school dear. closed down. <laughs> I had a cousin in New Jersey that I stayed with. Uh huh. But um, during that theater trip, I had been interviewed by New York Life at Denison, and they were going to pay for my trip. While I was there, I interviewed Mutual of New York. 
an equitable insurance company. All three made offers to me. And I think I like Mutual best because they had a ping pong room. And I like to play, love to play ping pong. Okay. In fact, my roommate and I won the interfraternity campus competition for doubles in Very year nice. when I was an undergraduate. Very nice. What year did you, then what year did you graduate from Denison then? 1955. 55, okay, and then, so go on from there. What, what happened next? And you took the job in New York. Took the job in New York, and then I flunked the Army Physical. So I had to decide, you know, what do I really want to do? And as I looked at what people were doing in that company, thinking I'd work up my way up, I didn't really like myself in those positions because I didn't want to be responsible to someone below me for what someone above wanted. What was the nature of the work that you were I was explain that for the <coughs> research of what you were doing? Well, I was an actuarial trainee, which, uh, so I was starting to take the actuarial exams, which is a series of beginning with quantitative insurance law and so on, culminating in a certification. In the first two years, I got through the first three exams. But clearly, by then, I decided I wanted to teach. And I'd grown up in an academic community, and I always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to go somewhere. So my ambition was actually to go back to a good liberal arts college, like Denison or Oberlin or Antioch. Sure. Um, what was it like living in New York in those days? Oh, I, it was very enjoyable for a single bachelor. You know, I could walk down and pick up tickets cheap for theater. And once you've been there, you learn to find things that aren't that expensive to do. So tourists come in and pay hotel prices and high restaurant prices, but it becomes expensive. But I found things to do. There are a lot of things also, even today, that are, don't cost very much. The yeah. museums are excellent. The museums are excellent. Central Park is nice right. during the day. Right. So, and let's see, it was about... During the second year there, I met my future wife. Was she working in New She was working for NBC as a liter uh, head of the literary rights department, mm -hmm. negotiating scripts for radio and television shows. And she, you know, we knew we were going to get married, but she didn't know she was going to marry a professor. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I I'd written my father saying, you know, I think I'd like to try teaching. You know, maybe an adjunct job with one of the New York schools. And he wrote a very convincing letter that I would not enjoy if I was holding down a full-time job. And that I really should think about going for a PhD first and then teaching. And at that point, uh, he, I. He, before he told me that economics is where I belong, but I didn't listen. At that point, it made sense. That I could use my mathematics, but apply it to interesting social and economic problems. It was a good match. Yeah, it turned out to be. Uh, and that my original thought that mathematics provided a, an option turned out to be true for me. The option I chose was one that made use of mathematics. Mm -hmm. But I didn't like the pure abstract reasoning of proving theorems that somehow didn't appeal to me. This has more buzz to it or something. Well, real world. Or, that's right, yeah. I mean, some math does have real world oh, applications. Sure. On it too. But this has a wider. This has a wider. So you decided to go to graduate school? So then? I decided to go to graduate school, and applied. he again suggested good schools because he knew. Sure. And I what, was, what field was your father in, incidentally? He was economics, too. Oh, okay. So, okay. And, and he knew that he felt that the profession was moving beyond him in a quantitative direction that, that he had not learned when he was younger. So he advised me. And it came down to Johns Hopkins, that I really felt welcome there in Yale, where they originally had told me, we don't talk to students until their second or third year. And I, I felt sort of a standoffishness. Wait, where was this at Yale? Yale. Huh. So it probably reflects the 
difference between today and those days about what the woman does. Because my wife could have kept her job in New York by going to Yale and we'd live somewhere in between. But she accepted my feeling that I wanted to go to uh, Johns Hopkins to quit her job, was overqualified in Baltimore. She got there. But we never really talked it out. You know, we just, this is just what I wanted to do. The decision wasn't for you to go on to school. And she, and, and to where I wanted to go. We might have made the same decision, but uh, it's okay. in retrospect, it worked out. we should have uh, <laughs> discussed it more. Well, you put, don't you, you have to put in the perspective of those times, and, and, and sometimes people, they jump ahead too fast and, you know, they say, but it, it, those times it was appropriate. This is what people were doing. That, that's what I said, compared with today. That's we, right. We'd have talked it out a lot more before right. I made the move. Yeah. Well, how was it at Johns Hopkins? Did you, did you I liked that? it. It was a small department. Uh, it had some outstanding people. Um, Simon Kuznets was there, who later won a Nobel Prize. Fritz Mockloff, who I worked for, uh, became president of the American Economic Association. Good context. Ev Ev Evzi Domar was a famous growth theorist. Uh, they got Musgrave there in public finance. Uh, T.C. Liu was very good quantitative. Um, and it, it all broke down just about the time I left. The, our uh, Mockle moved to Princeton, Kuznets and Domar went to MIT, or Domar went to MIT, Kuznets I think to Harvard. D.C. Liu went to Cornell. But it was fortunate for you. That but it was a small department and the faculty got to know the students quite well. And in fact, I think one reason I was successful in the program was before I started, I met with some upper graduate students. And they said the most single, single most important thing for your success is speaking up in the weekly seminar. The chairman sort of takes mental notes of what students are contributing. And so periodically I would look very carefully at the paper and make a, a comment or two, including something that Fritz Mockley overlooked in one of his papers. And I, I think that, and later on actually I was one of the formal discussions of the paper by Ed Ames, who was visiting from Purdue. And he had taken a Russian formula and an interesting application to growth um, production index bias as a measure of economic growth. But for the life of me, I could not follow how he started, from where he started, how he got the formula. So I turned around and said, well, if I want this formula, where should I start? And so he had it wrong at the beginning. Uh, so I think when I was able nicely to, to point out what he should have done, he was impressed and started to recruit me for Purdue. Very good. That's very nice. You, you think you think things through and observe and, and you know, mm -hmm. which is good. Uh, but then when Monklet moved to Princeton, he took three of us with him. I got my degree from Johns Hopkins, but I spent a year in Princeton, which was a delightful community. Very hierarchical. This one friend of mine from Denison was then an associate professor. You know, he'd come through three years, got his PhD, stayed on, three years promoted, <coughs> while I was still finishing <coughs> excuse me, my dissertation. <coughs> he later became president of Princeton, Bill Bowen. What's uh, his name again? Bill Bowen. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, but when he showed me around, he said, now here were the assistant professors live, here's the associate professors, here's where the full professors live. <laughs> <laughs> An interesting tour. <laughs> uh, but the department was egalitarian. And they uh -huh. let me take part in a few social events sure. in the department there. So I enjoyed that year in Princeton. It was a nice sort of change <clears throat> for you then, good and a good opportunity. Yeah. yeah. And I was born in a depression when the birth rate was low. And by the 60s, there was a baby boom coming on, and college enrollments were skyrocketing, and there were huge opportunities for jobs. Um, so I had four or five options to weigh. 
Purdue actually offered that year I finished. But Cornell came and gave an offer a couple thousand dollars more than anyone else. If I'd come for one year, T.C. Liu, who was at Johns Hopkins, was there. He was going on leave. He wanted someone to teach his courses. And so he knew you. He knew me. Uh -huh. And my wife had said, you know, she'd always wanted to go to Cornell, but couldn't afford it. And she was looking for colleges. So she was, in that case, enthusiastic about going sure, there. Sure, sure. Did you have any children at that point? We had one child born in Baltimore uh -huh. in 59. So she was one, year, one to two year old during the sure. first time. Our second daughter was born in Ithaca while we were there. Uh -huh. So from after you uh, your one year there, then what well, transpired? Was it on, did you know it was only going to be for one I, year? I knew it was a visiting appointment, but there was some chance it'd stay on. And sure. It turned out I wasn't all that comfortable there. The department was dominated by Morris Copeland, who was had made a very significant contribution to what's called flow of funds analysis for the economy. But he didn't like, he was anti-theory, even though he's taught the theory courses, and dominated the department in ways that uh, I didn't feel was very conducive for young faculty research. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, three of us that went there that year all left after one year. <laughs> so, and, and they decided I didn't quite fit what they wanted at first. So uh, I went back to Purdue and said, Are you, is that offer still good? And it turned out it was. Now, what year would this have been? That would have been 61. Um, Let's see, is that? Um, no, 62. Yeah, I was at Cornell from 1961 to 1962. It's like an interesting story of when I was recruited the year before I come up for an interview at Purdue. At lunch, three of the faculty members asked if I played bridge. Jay this Wy is at Purdue? At Purdue. Jay Wiley, Lance Davis, and uh, Jim Quirk. I said yes. They just happened to have in scheduled the next three interviews together. So we went to Jay Wiley's house and played bridge for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting little story. That's sort of nice. But, but it indicated the informality, even though it was a very lively department here. Um, and I couldn't help but feel a contrast between Cornell and Purdue. Sure. Because Purdue had been developed by Emanuel Weiler, the first dean of the Cranard School. He came and first developed an economics department and hired people, he, well, I think his ambition was to start a business school. And in order to sell it in Indiana, because Indiana University already had the business school, he said, well, I'm going to apply engineering techniques to management decisions and call it a school of management to differentiate it from what's at IU. So he did it by hiring, before the profession really caught up, a very talented mathematical economist. Stan Ryder, I think, had been at Stanford, recruited here. Uh, Vernon Smith, who was graduating from Harvard, was recruited here by Wiley. So Vernon went on to win the Nobel Prize. I, I, re I remember reading the news. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more, because Vernon is the one who, I think, really got my research on track after I got here. He I came saying, about the same time that you did? Or no, he, you he was a full professor. Oh, he was He'd already in the mid-50s. Oh, okay. He wasn't, he was a few years older, but not that much older. Sure. Just again, I, I spent a couple of years working in New York before I went back to graduate sure. school. Um, but let's see, where were we? You had come to Purdue. What was it like? Uh, and also the community. Tell us a little about when you. Right. Oh, and we had two daughters. Uh -huh. and we got a university duplex, half a duplex on Sheet Street, 
which was later moved out in the country. But they had a three-year appointment at Purdue, but the PRF gave me a two-year lease on this building. I was wondering, you know, can't they make it for three years so we can decide whether it will stay or not? Sure. Because I had thought, with all the opportunities, and I was looking for a place to teach, if I could always go from the university back to a liberal arts college, but I couldn't go the other way very well. If I went to a liberal arts college, I'd never make it into a research university. So again, this idea of keeping options open uh, is wise. Was why I chose that, even though I had some interest from Oberlin and Wesleyan College, um, and it was a good decision for me. Uh, as I said, the department was lively. Um, and Weiler's philosophy was just hire bright people and let them do what they want. And we'll find ways to cover courses. And, and so he really established an outstanding young faculty here. I think within the first 10 years, it was rated within the top 20 departments in the country. Did he really start the department yeah. then? He, yeah. was, he, started the, did he start the school? He started, well, he, came, he was hired to start it. Okay. He uh, came from, was it Harvard? From Illinois. Oh, uh, was it Harvard? He, he was teaching at Illinois. Oh, and okay. He witnessed the breakup there when the new Keynesians tried to throw out the old guard and okay. the battles. And so when he came here, he came to what was then a department of several now departments, socio sociology, economics, political science, history. And there was a, a, a school or something that com encompassed a lot of these departments. Yeah, and so it was a multidisciplinary department that serviced the ag school and the engineering sure. school. I remember reading a little bit about, I know what you're talking about. So the post-war development under Hovde was to make it a major university and have first-rate departments sure, separate. Right. So Weiler was hired to start the economics, but he also had this ambition to start a management school. But I think a lot of the success was the fact he built a first-rate economics department first, and then began hiring some very good management people, but attracting them by the quality of the, of the faculty already here. Sure. And there's a good synergy between economics and management. Mm -hmm. Where were you located? Because the, the building, for research, the building that exists now was not here when you came. I, we were housed in Stanley Quilter Annex. I think it's now where the... Um, class of 1950. Yes, now the class of 1950. That's right. So it was terrible facilities, actually. It was I remember the annex. <laughs> many of the faculty were down in the basement sharing small offices. I had an office I shared with Tom Brooks, who was teaching the law courses. And it had a southern exposure. It was on the second or third floor. And by late at, by afternoon, it heated up so it was unbearable. So I'd often come over to the library, <laughs> which is air conditioned. And it was not air conditioned, though, was it? The building? It was, yeah, at least it was much more comfortable. Oh, was it? No. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, Stanley Kohler Annex was. No. Was, I, I didn't think so. No. <laughs> Stanley Kohler. That was the. Yeah. The window opened. <laughs> yes. Oh, and there was a train that brought coal to the. Uh, to the power plant. Power over plant. Here. And it went around a curve. And if you were teaching in a room with the windows open, the screech just drowned out anything that went on. So you just had to stop, wait till the train passed. <laughs> we'll now have our break. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really luxury when the Cranert building, I think it was 1965, sure. was built. All right. And then they moved, you moved over, you moved that building to them. Okay. Had a nice office. Actually, looking at the corner, looking up State Street. It's a good spot. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, continue on now when uh, things started transpired and when you came. Okay. Well, first, one of the first courses I was asked to teach was a large 210 lecture class, which is not my fort. And we didn't have amplification. It was in this barn of a room that seated about 250 people in Stanley Coulter Annex. Uh, I survived for about a year and a half doing that uh, and teaching another introductory course. 
but they were short of people to teach macroeconomics and asked if I would do the graduate course in macroeconomics. And I also took over a course from Ed Ames called Current Economic Problems in my second year. And this was an opportunity, really, even though I wasn't trained very much in macroeconomics, to just stay a step ahead of the students and learn it myself as I was going along. So that fairly quickly got me into the graduate program so I could have contact with some of the PhD students. Sure. And some of those have been very successful around the Mort Camion and Hugo Simonshine. Great. Uh, so my research really didn't get on track. I'd done a dissertation on investment in central office equipment in the face of technological change. You know, how do they decide when to go from a manual station step by step, and as the new technologies made older ones obsolete, the problems of making the transition was, was of some interest. But I, again, it didn't really capture my enthusiasm of the research project. What really finally did was when Vernon Smith was doing his market experiments, he asked to come into my class and do an experiment with buyers and sellers, bidding and making offers, and reaching a contract. And yet, there's some economic theories about how the markets work. And he was really looking at himself in an experimental setting, how market worked. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by this technique and thought, well, there's a concept in macroeconomics introduced by John Maynard Keynes known as the multiplier. So when the government injects some spending into the economy, people that receive the income spend it, and there's a multiple effect on the economy. So Keynes was saying, to get, help get out of the depression, we need to stimulate the economy, sure. arguing this multiplier. But the theory was often put in as if it took an infinite sequence of spending and respending. And I was saying, well, what if I set up an experiment where the students made decisions about how much to produce. And I would control the consumer spending side. And I thought, this could happen in one or two steps if the producers anticipate correctly what's going to happen. So I started this out above equilibrium in one of the first classes, and sure enough, the economy collapsed toward equilibrium, but didn't stop there. It went shooting down, hit a floor when they worked off their excess inventories and then went back up. So I was generating business cycles. And I found some literature that actually predicted this kind of event. So I was combining working it into a class as a teaching device, but then began asking, you know, well, when you were making these production decisions, what would you expect your sales would be? So I was collecting from the class, the producers, their sales expectations. Mm -hmm. And I found that as we were going up, the economy was rising, they were always underestimating sales. As we came down, they were always overestimating. And again, I found this um, was a phenomenon that had been observed in the real world, from data from collecting sales forecasts. So that became one of my first major articles in the American Economic Review when I sort of combined this theory with the sure. experiment. It was rejected three times, actually, before it was accepted. The American Economic Review rejected it. Two others rejected it. And Ed Ames, who was really my mentor when I got here, uh, made a suggestion about how to put in a statistical test that would give us a more scientific sure. <laughs> good, good comment. And I did that, and I brashly sent it back to the American Economic Review, even though they'd rejected an earlier version, and they accepted it. Very good. So that got me into sort of the role of expectations in economics, which so much does depend on expectations. When you think, are we in a recession? What are people thinking? How does it affect their behavior? Yeah. You hear that on the news every night. What do you yes. 
daily. So that, and I say thanks to Vernon Smith, got me in a direction that I really felt enthusiastic about and could pursue. And he, I think it was the summer of 64, he and Lester Lay at Carnegie Mellon organized a workshop on experimental economics. And I had another idea, what's known as a cobweb model, where, let's say, produ farmers produce based on what they think the price is going to be. If they think it's a low price, they don't produce much. If they don't produce much, the price is high. So next year, oh, high price, I'll produce a lot. The price goes back down. If you sort of trace that out, it could be either expanding or contracting this cobweb. And again, I was thinking, well, what if I set up an experiment? And no matter how potentially unstable I made this market, it zapped right into equilibrium. And I, I realized that the reason was that the producers were not taking the latest price, but they were taking all the information. So if you have a low price and a high price, you pick an average. And it turns out that was pretty close to equilibrium. But what I wanted to prove was that this kind of model had to, always had to converge. And it was one of the most interesting experiences in the department because I would, I didn't know quite how to prove it. So I went to several of my colleagues, like Stan Ryder. He said, well, you could think of some boundedness conditions. He's the mathematician. Bill Starbuck said, well, why don't you simulate? He was a computer type. Kira Takayama suggested Pontryagin's maximizing principle, which had nothing to do with it. He thought it was important. But it was kind of fun to see how each of these people thought about a problem that I could pose. How they would deal how, with How it. would they approach this? I finally found the solution when I was teaching difference equations in one of my courses. I found in the text I was using a way to handle that kind of problem. That became another publication. And actually, the experiment I reported was a publication in 67. And two years later, I published the proof of invariably stable cobweb model. Very good. Uh, so I think I was a little slow to develop in my research. And probably by today's standards, I would not have been promoted as quickly as I was. But again, there was such a shortage of faculty of my age group and such a demand in universities that people were getting very quick promotions. And I think the faculty saw that I was on track. So they Can't helped, help. they, they helped me get yeah. promoted right. here. Yeah. It, and also, I, don't you think the procedures allowed have changed over time? Well, there were still like the that. three stages of yeah, uh, department. There's more factors that seem to come into play uh, than, than perhaps, I've heard that others have been here for quite a long period of time, that it's a lot different now than, say, 15 or some years Well, they've ago. been raising the bar, I think. It's harder and harder to get promoted. Uh, Purdue didn't make, did not make a mistake in my case, but... No, 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 but... But, I'm, but, but in that case, it's today, not easy. Uh, yeah. it would not have been good enough, I don't but I think they saw I was finally on track. And, and that's what they're looking for. Yeah. That's right, exactly. You got that, uh, tell us a little about that. When you, after that economic, you were the research over there in Manchester, you got that PRF grant. Uh, that was an NS NSF grant that PRF got. Oh, yes. The, uh, to support that study on inflation. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. When I read that, they, the money went to PRF, but yeah. you were the PI. Yeah, I would, right. Okay. Well, let me tell you about the sabbatical year in Manchester. Good. That was, again, another turning point in uh, my research because they had a very lively department there, too. And I wanted to do a sabbatical in England. And Mike Barkin had come through, and I talked to him at length and sent him a Vita and my interest. I didn't hear anything, and then Jack Johnston, a very prominent econometrician, called me on the phone and offered me the fellowship in economic statistics, which I hadn't even applied for. 
He said, well, I look like the best candidate available. And I, I jumped at the chance. Wonderful. They would pay me, and we could live on that and then use my sabbatical half pay to travel in Europe the next summer. So the economics department had a, uh, a grant from their counterpart, the NSF, uh, for to study inflation. And so they had an inflation workshop. And Mike Parkin had gotten this set of data from Gallup on people's predictions of, you think prices will go up, go down, stay the same. And one day at coffee, he said, you know, if we draw a distribution of that expectations, and we know how many are in this point, how many in that point, can we quantify what the inflation expectations were? We kicked it around for a while and didn't come up with any solution. But that night, I began thinking about it some more, and I realized in psychology there's the concept of a just noticeable difference. Weights are close together, you can't tell which is heavier. But enough difference you can't. Light intensity, all sorts of senses. So I thought, what if the same is true of perceiving inflation? If there's just just noticeable difference, if it's more, plus or minus 2%, so you can tell. So he said, well, if we can add that measure, uh, we can quantify it. And we can estimate that by saying, well, if the expectations are correct on average, how big did that gap have to be? And that became a famous paper that's now known as the Carlson Parkin technique. He worked on it pretty much the rest of the time I was there, off and on. And finally, it was delayed publication in Conomica because they wanted the data, the raw data. But Gallup didn't want to let them publish it because they were hoping they might sell it to somebody else. I finally pointed out to Parkin that if you took the formulas which we published and the estimates of inflation and variance, you can reverse our formulas and get the raw data, figure out what the raw data is. So yeah, it worked. Huh? And it worked. And Economica decided to take the paper, and it was very widely cited. In fact, there's a, a group called CERET. It's based in Munich. It's the Center for International Research on Economic Tendency Surveys. I went to one of their conferences in Lisbon in 1979 and hadn't realized how extensively this was cited at the time because I heard about this famous Carlson Parkin technique. So that was one of the papers that was most cited and that was probably in the earlier days when they didn't do a lot of cited reference uh, searching, you know, and, no. and checking and things. Now it's no. much easier to, to do. I mean, now I can go back and say, oh, there are 200 citations. And I don't think that. even in those days, because I did a lot of database, or people weren't really in tune. They didn't think about that, you know. No. I must verbally say, yes, so-and-so told me they saw it listed in another reference. But there wasn't the uh, ease with which now people can pull up that data. Although I think people were aware of it, because I remember... Oh, awareness, yes, but being it, able it to... It makes a difference to be cited, because oh, yeah. one person said, I'll, I'll pay you a dollar for every favorable citation, <laughs> and 95 cents for un unfavorable ones. <laughs> <laughs> so just being cited, whether it's favorable or not. Oh. Um, we, go so ahead. Th really, that got me from sales expectations into inflation expectations. And I was, then when I got back, was, had found another data set collected by uh, Joseph Livingston, who was a journalist in Philadelphia. And for 40 years, he'd been asking people what their predictions were for all sorts of can you write it up in the newspaper? And yeah, yeah and, and he collect he kept all the raw data over those years. And generously I several others had gotten it from him, but I got the raw data. Because one of the assumptions we had to make in this Carlson Parkin was, well, what's our distribution do you assume? And we assumed a normal distribution, but it could be anything. 
And so I wanted to look at the Livingston data and see how, how good was our assumption about the Livingston about the normal distribution. So eventually I did publish a paper in the Journal of the American Statistical Association, our inflation expectations normally distributed. The answer is almost. <laughs> not, not quite, but close enough to, to okay. live with our assumptions. Yeah. Let me ask you your sources for the data. What, uh, you sort of hear from some people. Has, has that been of help to you over the years? in some of the raw data that you or you sort of know some sources that we might want to tap yeah. into when we've got an idea on pay on the research yeah. where you need you might have a source to get the raw data. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's it's usually I see references to it. Somebody right. else has has looked at it. Right. That gives you a little bit of gives me a, oh, oh oh that sounds like it might fit when I'm looking at it. Right. So it's good to keep track of the literature. Right. Yeah. So this um, National Science Foundation yeah, that uh, one grant that was uh, really a follow-up from what I'm telling you about sure. with the Livingston data and studying right. more inflation expectations. Yeah. So it's really st that direction started in Manchester and, and then followed with this grant. Yeah, that's very that's very nice. Yeah. Uh, again, several papers uh, emerged from that. Sure including one, probably the second most cited paper, is what's called a study of price forecasts, which was um, really telling the profession how to deal with the Livingston data. Because some of them are moving naively, said, well, it's a six-month forecast, here's the CPI now, here's what they think will be in six months. But they didn't realize when they were making the forecast, they didn't know what the CPI was yet. They had to go back a few months. So I was reworking the data and explaining in detail. I really was an eye of an economic historian at that point about how you should approach these sure. data. Sounds that way. And I published it in an obscure journal, actually, the Annals of Economic and Social Measurement, because they took all the tables and everything. But I also published a comment in the American Economic Review on a paper about inf interest rates as short-term predictors of inflation. And so in that comment, I was showing you know, what maybe the author should have thought about and cited this other paper. So people, everyone who reads the AER are interested in this topic. So then they began citing my Anyone who used the Livingston data would have to cite my study of price forecasts. That worked very well. So that that was probably that in the paper with Parkham, one of the first really big hits, as they call it, in the yeah. profession. Very good. And your publication list is very good. I, I read read not all the art not, not the articles, but when looking at the list, it was really good. Quite I managed, uh, you know, one thing that. You'll notice that I team sometimes jump around a bit, too. And it's partly I work with graduate students, the ones that want to come to me. I rarely suggested a topic. They came to me with a topic. I mean, often it's related to something I was teaching, of course, but, uh, or related to something I was doing. But their interest often piqued my interest. Sure. I would begin to work with some of them or think about things in ways I hadn't thought about before. So while I was supervising them, they were also sort of guiding me to some extent. And it works both ways because it's this is an area that's somewhat related to you, but at a little different tangent. And Professor, how would you think we could do that? And so it works together. Yeah, so it's know. a nice interaction. Right, exactly. So I think that I, I was very fortunate to have almost 50 PhD students I supervised over those 40 years. I was on another 50 committees as, as a member. In fact, when I retired, somebody figured that I had been on one quarter of all the PhD dissertation committees at the time when I... Oh, we were span. That's pretty good. <laughs> 
You were also on the graduate council too, and you served on the graduate council too, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, but, and other committees and but things. The graduate council, I just sort of sat and listened to Fred Andrews. And <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I didn't have much to do on that. I did, of course, chairing the um, university um, nominating committee. It yes, I did quite see a that. Powerful uh, yes. committee. Right. That's part of the within the university senate. Yes. Correct. Okay. Uh, yes, because you know, there's things everyone wants to be on the athletic affairs committee or university promotion. You send out the card and you check off the, the check off yeah. list. Well, I don't. I've been told and followed the advice: throw away that card, and you won't have to be on the university committee. <laughs> Others have voiced that same thing. <laughs> but uh, or put down what you really want. So there, I think the way I got on the University Promotions Committee was having chaired the nominating committee. I was there were three year overlapping terms. People knew me and saw my name and said, "Oh, let's put him on the University." It's okay. It's all right. Because sometimes it's a difficult when there's a lot of people, and it's good to know somebody that that knows. That they you. thought would be responsible. Sure. Right. So that, that was how that worked. <laughs> <laughs> this was a form of an old boy network. <laughs> Yeah, served under quite a few deans. Was um, was Weiler the dean when you came? Yes. And then after that, John Day. John Day. John Day was the associate dean, uh, and when Weiler retired, John Day stepped up as the dean. Uh -huh. Then he became vice president for what's now called development or advancement. Advancement, yes, I did read that. Um, he we had. I think Bill Llewellyn was an interim dean, and then Keith Smith was hired. Um, so who was out after Keith? Would that have been Widenauer? Yeah, right, Dennis Widenauer, a 10-year. Okay. And I don't know, you should talk to him if you haven't. Okay, uh, yes. He's someone you should definitely, because he was a student here when I first came. Oh, okay. Okay. So. Is John Day, He's no longer living, is he? Yes, he is. Oh, is he's he in bad health, but he's... Oh, he's still he's a, Okay. Yeah, we were hoping he'd come back for the 50th reunion. Do you have a 50th coming up? We had it last oh, fall. You, oh, that, oh, that, okay, okay. But there are a couple other schools uh, that I know, like, the, I've heard the vet schools is coming up next year, so right. I apologize for that. Yeah, Vernon Smith came back and Hugo Sancho. Now I, re I recall. Yeah. Um, and then... Yes, Rick. And Dr. Kozier came after Kozier the Right. Okay. And then, of course, you were here when Dr. Humphrey was the president. Yes. He came, and then Dr. Hansen, and then Dr. Hicks was the interim, and then Dr. Baring, and Dr. Jester. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's, each of them brings a little different flavor. And uh, when I came, when Dr. Hubby, when I, I came in '68, so Dr. Humphrey was the president. Been here a while too. <laughs> yeah, well, he was president for 25 years, That's I right. believe. That's right. One comment I was going to, an observation uh, you were mentioning about when you came here that the enrollment had increased quite a bit. The same thing occurred, I understand, from people I've interviewed after World War II when the people had been in the war, they all came back and they wanted to finish up, and there was a big influx. Well, the GI Bill. The G yeah. And they got the GI Bill, and, and there's some several people said. They had already had a couple of years, but they wanted to finish up and get on, you know, get on with their life and do some things. So there was a big, big influx of students at that time. And my father saw that at Antioch too. I imagine. And uh, the, these returning veterans were very serious because they really trying to make up for lost time. Right. That that comment that I've heard from other people who were here when that occurred, and they noticed it right away. In fact, one of my classmates at Johns Hopkins uh, had been a member of the Communist Party in New York City and got disenchanted when Hungary was invaded by the Soviets and became apolitical and went back for his PhD. But he had this sense, I've got to catch up. And Bob Fogel uh, was so successful, he won a Nobel Prize, too, uh, for his work. Interesting. First yeah. on the railroads. I can remember when he got the idea and the excitement, he bubbled over right. with how we could measure this. 
could make a comment about Vern, uh, that since you, he was a colleague when you first came and then he came back for the anniversary, I think the researchers would appreciate a comment if you'd care to make one, because you knew him when he, when he, was, when he was here and you, when you first came. Well, when he started, nobody was doing the sort of experimental work that he was. Mm -hmm. And he had trouble convincing people that it was publishable work. But he kept at it and gradually it caught on. And he just began, he had such a fertile mind that he, was, he went and you know, kept thinking of things to do and ways to apply it in such a way that he became the father of experimental economics. I, I might say, you know, I talked about that paper when I went around talking to colleagues about how would you approach this problem. By the time I had the solution, uh, Vernon and Charlie Plott were having weekly sort of luncheons, informal seminars. It wasn't a big one, just we'd meet for lunch and talk about research. And I talked about that paper, and both of them were very enthusiastic, so I think that encouraged me too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Vernon's uh, right. enthusiasm for what he was doing. Right, yeah. So, and, but had you kept in touch with him after he left? Not a lot. I, I've seen him three or four times, uh -huh. but uh, my work... One reason I didn't follow up on experimental economics was what I wanted to do required, required more sophisticated computer computations. The later developed, but at the time it was, you know, carry the punch cards over and run it through the machine and wait, wait. Day until it comes back. Yeah. And I didn't have the patience to wait until the technology caught up. Vernon did. <laughs> <laughs> he, he really helped develop the technology sure. to allow sure. right. yeah. this immediate <laughs> feedback. Um, talk a little bit about some of the awards that you've gotten. Uh, you're in Who's Who in Economics, and you got the Outstanding Research International Investment Forum. Yeah. Some of the awards. That's very nice. Um, the Who's Who. I've talked to a couple of the papers that had big hits. There was another one on with Preston McAfee on, uh, involved consumer search theory and you know how, how can you preserve a district a variation of price? You go had a student that sampled stores and found different prices of goods for the same product for the same product exactly the same product. And you were wondering you know why is this? Well, with Preston's help, who was a mathematical genius, you know, I posed the problem and he solved it. <laughs> um, that paper took off and got a lot of attention. What were some, what were some, can you make a comment on that particular, what you found in the study? Well, well, the, the earlier study, uh, you know, what would you think might have the widest distribution of prices is a contraceptive, <laughs> because there's not a lot of trading information. Others in a, a small market, you, like the New Orleans, where the sellers are all around, there isn't much difference. Sure, interesting. Yeah. But uh, what the paper with Preston was saying, is there a, a coherent theory of both consumer and producer behavior that would generate this kind of result? So I think the who's who in economics was just based initially on the thousand most cited economists. That's very nice. And so that very was good. Yeah. And I noticed you're still working you're still working with some still students. Uh, you, you noticed that on your Vita. Yes. Yeah. Nevin Valev, who's now an associate professor at Georgia State, uh, he worked with me on a sort of international money problem, but he's from Bulgaria. And one day he came in and said, you know, Bulgaria is about to go to a currency board. And inflation has been hyperinflation. Uh, what do you think if I would try to get forecasts of what people think is going to happen to inflation before the currency board comes into effect? The currency board essentially freezes prices effectively. And that started a whole change of chain of research that he's been doing, collecting surveys in Bulgaria, getting into papers like that. So is a throwback to sort of my early expectation okay. stuff that sure. got me into him. Yeah. Plus the fact that I 
I might interest in another story about how I got into the international monetary area. It was because of my two sabbaticals in England. The first one, just before I was ready to move money to England, Nixon broke the Bretton Woods Agreement and the dollar depreciated. And suddenly it cost me $2.55 instead of $2.40 to buy pounds. Then I took a second sabbatical in London in 1980. And again, the dollar was very expensive. And, and I began wondering, you know, what are, is it me or there's reasons for these gyrations? And so I began working sort of exchange rate theories into my macroeconomics course. And then some several PhD students said, came and said, could we have a seminar on this in the PhD program? I said, well, if you help me put together a reading list, and we'll go over it. And that really reoriented my research, mm -hmm. or my intro, teaching interest into mm -hmm. international monetary issues. Um, this award for outstanding research, um, I went to Chicago and there were several presentations made. It's a result of work with uh, Carol Osler that I'm still doing, actually. On, uh, really a model of exchange rate behavior. And so, they, they couldn't decide, apparently, they when they voted after the presentations, there was an empirical one and my theoretical paper. So they decided to give the award to both of us. That's the two top ones. Yeah. Yeah. So that that came out of uh, really the work I've been doing on the international mm -hmm. exchange rate. Yeah. Um, the other um, Pew Fellowship in International Affairs, the Pew Foundation wanted to really encourage case method teaching in international courses, thinking that's the best way to train diplomats in international affairs. So they offered these fellowships to come to Harvard for two weeks to learn the case method. Most of them were political scientists, but they took about five economists and some other uh, disciplines. Uh, and the only condition was that you would teach at least one course the next year using the case method. At your institution? At your institution. You'd come back. And in fact, the director would come around and actually videotaped one of my classes to prove what was going on <laughs> <laughs> and critiquing it afterwards. <laughs> so I actually, I became very enthusiastic about that. And I published a couple papers about using the case method. Right. economics courses. Right. It's wise, widely used in the uh, management. Arnie Cooper, you probably talked to, uh, is a devotee uh -huh. of the case method. Mm -hmm. He uses it almost entirely. I would work it in maybe five or six cases a year, doing them in a historical sequence, uh, starting with uh, when Britain had to decide whether to go back to the gold standard after World War II. Uh, when Kennedy, or when the Bretton Woods system uh, was formed, or what went into that. When Kennedy's problems of how do you deal with the balance of payments under this Bretton Woods system. Another one which was fascinating was Nixon's speech in 1971, breaking the Bretton Woods system. So I could, well, Part of that speech, he has outlined a policy of he was going to freeze prices, no wage price increases. He's going to put a surtax on any imports. Um, there's something else he was going to do. Oh, well, and what I pointed out to the class after we'd done this case, I was hit every way negatively by that speech. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they like the anecdote that uh, you know, it went through the policy as well. That's going to cost me money because I was supposed to get a raise, but it's frozen. I was going to buy a Volkswagen and bring it back. <laughs> That's going to cost. Um, he floated the pound, so it became more expensive. 
They catch it coming all ways. Yeah. Mm. So, as I say, I couldn't really f get many other people in economics to use this method. But, but I'm still an advocate, but it's, sure. it's useful. I don't like it entirely, but I like it as neat supplements because the students get very involved with the decision-making yeah. process. And, so, and, and problem-solving and decision-making, which, right. which is really skills that, that they're looking for and right. are, are needed, really. So yeah. that works out. As several students have said it's the best course they had at Purdue. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Any other general comments? Uh, what about, uh, tell us about your family and, uh, that you have. Well, well, there, did they go to Purdue? No. Um, maybe like me, they wanted to leave town from <laughs> where they grew up. Um, my older daughter, Robin, went to Miami University in Ohio. And my younger daughter went to the University of Iowa. She's a writer and like the writer's workshop there. Which has been going on for a long time. For years, famous writer. Yes, it is. And she made it her senior year, got into the writer's workshop. She got her master's there, too. Yeah. Uh, she has two sons, and my other daughter has two daughters and a son, so I've got five grandchildren. Okay. Uh, fairly sad, in the early 90s, my wife developed a, a progressive dementia that began not being able to speak clearly or finish sentences or words, and it got worse and worse. And they diagnosed it at Mayo Clinic as probable Peck's disease, but they couldn't know until they did a brain autopsy. And she got gradually worse. About 97, I had to put her in a nursing home. And she lived another four years. So those three or four years before she went into a nursing home really interfered with my research. And it, uh, I was more going through the motions, meeting my classes, meeting the students, but not generating much uh, myself. So That's hard. Once that once she was in a nursing home, I felt, I mean, I went there every day to see her. But here in town? Here in town. Mm -hmm. George Davis Manor was very close. And sure. I was quite happy with the care. Mm -hmm. So that slowed me down a little bit for sure. two years there. Right. But, uh, yeah. but I didn't quit until, well, yet. <laughs> <laughs> Never do. <laughs> uh, do you have a uh, favorite Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with the researchers? or? Either that or how about an outstanding event? Something like that come to mind? I enjoy Purdue athletics. Um, probably the success of the basketball team <laughs> this year <laughs> is a highlight. Right. Yes. Coming from right. you know, the building up over two years from an also ran to a right. major power. Okay. I did go, I've gone to two bowls games. I went to the Alamo Bowl and the Rose Bowl. Which is enjoyable. Yeah. Um, I took, in the course of the time here, I took four and a half sabbaticals. And all, always abroad. Always to English speaking. Did you countries. go for the whole year? Uh, Manchester was the only one for the whole year. Oh. The one in London was just the half year. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I went to uh, Sydney, Australia for Yes, semester. I saw that. Yeah. And my contact there moved to Wellington, New Zealand. And so my next one was in Victoria University in Wellington. And I liked that so much I went back for the last half sabbatical to Wellington. Yeah. So being an academic provides great opportunities for travel. There are international conferences, you can pick and choose, sure. where shall I put a paper? So combine international contacts with tourists and sightseeing, right. seeing places. It's a, it's a good deal. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a good great, opportunity. It's a great deal. Mm -hmm. I think I really appreciate that more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's part of, you know, what it helps it enriches your life yeah. and your teaching and what you're involved in. Any, any uh, some other things that you'd like to share that you can think of? Mm -hmm. Or anything, topics that you want to return to? Not at the moment. Okay, okay. 
if you decide, you know, we can always do a follow up if you decide, but uh, um, I really, at what, um, in your retirement you're keeping busy, I was going to ask you that, now you're doing some, do you come in almost every day? No. Oh, okay. Um, no, I'm letting my co-authors take most of the initiative now on the research. Okay. Okay. I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church and uh -huh. uh, very much involved in their finance. And, uh, sure. Um, I have a partner who's from Germany, and we travel extensively. I've probably done more than 25 elder hostels. Got a favorite? Several favorites. Oh. Uh, they're, they're almost all well done. Uh, I like the international ones, a couple of boat trips on rivers in Germany, uh, Mediterranean cruises. Those are kind of nice. I've never done them, but I think they're sort of yeah. nice to do. Well, I, I recommend them. Yeah. I'll put that on my list. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you have an interest, a place to go, and a time of the year, there's almost something there. <laughs> Just look through their catalog. Well, when do I want to go? What interests me? Where, where do I want to go? And what are they offering? That's right. Make they can go from there, right? Yeah. Any closing comments, Dr. Carlson, that you can think of? No, I think that should do it for yeah. now. Alrighty. I may, once I see the transcript, have some thoughts. Sounds to, good. Uh, we can do that. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you.